Welcome. A distinctive element of analytical science involves our disciplinary emphasis on understanding how measurements are made, as this affects the goodness of the measurements that we can actually realize using analytical instruments. So in this podcast today, we're going to discuss how a UV visible actually works. By the end of the podcast, students should be able to draw a block diagram for a UV vis spectrometer and explain how the instrument works. Name two commonly used excitation sources and explain how these sources produce UV visible light. Explain the function of a monochromator. Name two dispersive elements used in monochromators and be able to show how these, each of these dispersive elements actually works. Compare two commonly used detection schemes and specify the advantages and disadvantages of each. And lastly, name two UV vis detectors and be able to compare and contrast the advantages and disadvantages of each. <coughs> so let's get started. Now, we need to really start our discussion by first making sure we're on the same page. So we're going to review what we actually want to measure. And if you recall, ideally, we really want two pieces of information. One, I want qualitative information on the wavelength ranges of light that my analyte absorbs, as this is going to provide me with information on its electronic structure. And two, I want information on how much light it, it absorbs, as then I can use that to actually quantitate my analyte, ultimately using Beer's law, absorbance at wavelength lambda, equals concentration of the sample, usually in molarity, multiplied by the molar absorptivity at that wavelength, epsilon sub lambda, times the sample path length, L, and that's usually uh, one centimeter. Now, what I can imagine directly measuring, of course, isn't absorbance, but rather percent transmittance at a specific wavelength. And I say this because I can break the measurement down in my mind visually as follows. If I know the number of photons of a specific color of light traveling per second, they're incident on my sample, then the measurement that we call percent transmittance is simply obtained by determining how many photons per second of that specific color of light are incident on the sample and how many are transmitted through. And if you recall, we call the incident flux of photons p naught lambda at that wavelength and the emergent flux of photons at that wavelength, p lambda. Well, if you have that information, then percent transmittance is going to be uh, 100 times p sub lambda over p naught lambda. And we know a relationship between absorbance and percent transmittance, which gets us to the relationship I show you at top, that the absorbance at that wavelength is going to equal the log of p naught lambda divided by p lambda. So uh, if I can make my measurement using this basic visual picture, then I can ultimately obtain the qualitative and quantitative information that I seek. Now, since my uh, analyte is only going to absorb light in a specific wavelength range, I'm going to need to think about some way to send uh, different wavelengths through my sample at different times, or I'm going to have to find some other measure, uh, a method of differentiating the wavelengths of light. Um, and basically, with this information, I think I've created a visual picture from which uh, we can create a roadmap for the design of our spectrometer. So let's actually do that. And what I'm depicting on this slide really is what analytical chemists refer to as the basic block diagram for an analytical instrument. And you'll hear us talk about these an awful lot, particularly once you get to instrumental analysis. <coughs> so in the block diagram, you show the sufficient set of com components that's going to allow the analyst to actually make that measurement. And so fundamentally, in terms of a UV vis, there are four. A basic instrument is going to need to consist of a light source. And that light source, obviously, is going to have to create a fairly constant flux of photons with energies across the UV visible spectrum. Um, because I'm going to be measuring absorbance 
at a specific wavelength, then I need to have some way of selecting out um, one specific group of photons with a specific energy or wavelength. And then I'll send them through my sample. And I need to think about the sample as well uh, because uh, the uh, Beer's law has to be obeyed. And that means that we have to have a constant path length uh, for the light uh, through that sample. And then the last um, element that's relatively important um, is we have to have something, a detector, something that's actually going to count photons of light and then um, generally we measure electrical signals. So I have to have find some way to convert those numbers of photons of light into an electrical signal. All right, so that's given us basically four elements for a spectrometer, a light source, and we'll talk about two, tungsten, halogen, or deuterium. A uh, monochrometer, that's going to be the name for the device, and it, should, it, it is exactly as it sounds. It's going to turn poly or many uh, colored light, polychromatic light, into mono or single wavelength light, monochromatic light. I'm going to need a cuvette, something to hold the sample, to allow the light to be completely transmitted through the sample, um, but also at the same time to provide this constant path length uh, uh, for our measurement. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to need a detector. And there are three we really should talk about, but in this podcast, I'm going to talk about phototubes and photomultipliers. And we'll talk about a third kind of detector, photodiode array, um, which is really the basis for uh, CCDs, charge coupled detectors. And we'll do that in a separate video. So let's get going. In order to understand why we use what we use as light sources, we really need to consider what characteristics we expect our light source to exhibit. And what I'm doing here in terms of laying out ideal characteristics, I'm going to be doing this for each of the four different components as I'm trying to model for you basically how an analyst thinks. Um, so there's basically three important considerations. Um, and the first is that my light source is going to need to provide photons across the full UV visible near infrared spectral range. Um, the second characteristic is it, it would be really great. Um, it's going to minimize my work in terms of spectrometer design, but wouldn't it be wonderful if this imaginary um, light source could provide the same number of color, same number of photons, a blue light as of red light and as of, and as of green light. <laughs> and the reality is, I'll tell you up front, that's not going to happen, but we'll come uh, fairly close in, in, in uh, terms of being able to essentially fulfill this requirement. And the last characteristic that's extremely important is turn my instrument on. I want to make a series of measurements. So I want to be sure that um, sample A saw the same number of photons of light as did sample B, as did sample C, as did sample Z. So um, basically what I'm asking is that there be constant power output over um, or photon output over uh, the entire time that the instrument runs. And in point of fact, all three of these are fairly uh, difficult requirements to fulfill. Uh, and in point of fact, there's absolutely uh, no perfect UV visible light source. But we do have uh, several though that do a fairly good job of meeting um, these requirements. And so we're gonna talk about them. And they are the deuterium lamp and the tungsten halogen lamp. So, <coughs> Let's start with the tungsten halogen lamp. Um, this one actually should be fairly familiar, at least to some of you, as you've probably encountered a Torchier style lamp in your or a friend's home. And uh, these are basically tungsten halogen lamps. Uh, the uh, lamp basically is a bulb, and the bulb is, we call it an envelope, and it's made from an optically transparent material, not glass but quartz, and we'll talk about this. And inside the lamp, uh, there is a very regularly and tightly coiled filament of high quality tungsten wire. And you evacuate this bulb, uh, and uh, you seal it, and you fill it, backfill it, with uh, a small amount of iodine gas at um, a relatively low pressure. 
and then you um, heat this wire through resistance uh, to relatively high temperatures and I'm talking like 2900 degrees Kelvin when you heat the wire high, hot enough it basically glows red and that and when it glows red it starts to emit photons of light and that's really what we mean when we say incandescent and those photons of light are emitted from about 320 nanometers all the way out to 2500 nanometers so and it's pretty continuous wavelength coverage which is very nice uh, so it's basically across the entire near uv visible and infrared spectral range now uh, i also would be uh, neglectful if i didn't mention that these are relatively inexpensive lamps uh, compared to the deuterium lamp that I'm going to tell you about next. Um, now, I should also mention about halogen. So what's the role of the halogen? The I, and it's actually iodine in the lamp. Well, basically when that tungsten becomes incandescent, it volatilizes and sometimes um, it will uh, condense on a cool spot on the inside of the comparatively cold quartz envelope of the lamp. And as you deposit more and more and more on this other spot, well, guess what? Eventually you no longer have a tungsten filament that can become incandescent. And you've probably, by the way, seen these um, uh, uh, hot spots where uh, your, your lamp has failed um, at home. Uh, we add the iodine inside the envelope um, and it's there. It basically collides with the, um, uh, the uh, tung uh, gaseous tungsten and when it hits it, um, it the uh, complex that forms tends to decompose once it's formed and uh, it will redeposit back um, on that tungsten filament, essentially making it self-healing and uh, regenerating and extending the life of the lamp. So it has a very important role. All right, now as a light source, uh, the tungsten halogen lamp, the deuterium lamp, no lamp, puts out <coughs> a flat um, distribution in terms of power, uh, um, a number of photons per second uh, emerging uh, from that lamp. Um, but what it does do is it uh, emits light with a characteristic energy distribution such that you can actually know how many photons, uh, relatively speaking, you have of blue and green and uh, yellow and orange and red photons of light. And um, the fact that it, it emits this predictable, um, and I'll mention temperature dependent spectrum that uh, for which you can actually write um, the uh, um, in, in, uh, energy uh, distribution curve. Um, is a, a pos uh, something positive in its favor. Now, um, oops, jumped a little ahead here. Um, basically, it acts as what we call a black body. Um, a black body absorbs all electromagnetic radiation incident upon it, and then it re-radiates that radiation, producing the, a, this distinctive temperature-dependent um, distribution of photons. And if you want an example of a black body, um, the sun is a wonderful example here. But the key point is that this energy distribution is predictable and uh, in terms of making UV visible measurements, it means we have command over P naught lambda in terms of our percent transmittance uh, measurement. Now, um, why a quartz envelope? So I'm gonna jump back to that. That's the purpose of this slide. Um, and uh, this is a, a percent transmission curve uh, that a company called NSG Precision Cells puts out um, with acronyms uh, describing different optically transparent materials are actually used in cuvettes. And I've added um, three terms in there, glass, supersil, infrasil. Uh, those are the cur transmission curves that correspond to the three materials very commonly used in cuvette materials. And if you uh, look at supercell and infracell, you can see that they're relatively flat. They don't absorb the light uh, pretty much across the uh, UV invisible spectral range. And then in the case of infracell, it doesn't absorb IR light. It's basically supercell, 
uh, in which uh, the uh, water has been baked out. <coughs> and the uh, large dip you see around uh, 27 to 2800, uh, that's actually due to the absorbance of water in the uh, supercell. Uh, so that's the difference between those two. Glass, if you'll notice, um, it has a markedly different uh, transmission curve and it basically absorbs all the photons of light um, that are below about 300 nanometers. So it's clearly not a good material to use if you're thinking about making a lamp because if you want the lamp to um, produce UV photons, well, um, they're all going to be absorbed by the envelope of the lamp. And so that's why we typically use quartz or um, on this curve I've labeled it supercell um, because uh, any photons of UV light that are produced, those will actually be transmitted through the envelope. That makes the lamp a little bit more expensive, by the way, too. <coughs> now, <clears throat> this slide gives you a sense of what that energy distribution from this tungsten halogen lamp looks like as a function of temperature. And I'm showing you this to mention, uh, to make a uh, point of the fact that the temperature is a variable here, too. And so if you look at where uh, each of these uh, curves peaks, you notice it's strongly wavelength dependent uh, in, in terms of uh, the temperature that you're heating the uh, uh, lamp to. So um, the higher you heat it, the more you blue shift um, the emission from the lamp. In other words, shift it to shorter wavelengths. Um, uh, and the other thing I'd like you to notice here is that most of the emission, most of the photons of light that come from this lamp are actually in the infrared spectral range. In other words, basically this lamp is a heat generator. So if we want it to work in our favor, we need to use higher operating temperatures. This can be a little bit more problematic uh, in terms of the life of the lamp, hence the need for the tungsten halogen versus tungsten. Um, and uh, bear in mind that your lamp is, is uh, a heat generator, and so you need to, you're going to need to provide some way of cooling in your uh, UV visible instrument. So now let's talk about our second light source, and that's the deuterium arc lamp. And I've drawn a little cartoon here for you, and again, you have a quartz envelope. Inside this one, um, there are two electrodes, and uh, they face each other, and one of the electrodes has a large hole in it. And uh, deuterium gas is introduced. First you evacuate this envelope, then you backfill it with some deuterium gas. And deuterium gas obviously is gonna be fairly expensive. Um, and you make contact outside the uh, envelope to the two electrodes through wires, apply a voltage across them, and when you do this, uh, you, you can photo excite the deuterium gas and the reaction is shown at right. And you see there's a deuterium star and the star means that, that uh, one of the two deuterium uh, atoms that's uh, produced when the deuterium decomposes or breaks up becomes photo excited. So it's emitting light and it's this emission from the deuterium that is the source of the uh, light uh, for <coughs> um, this lamp. And it's, again, important, uh, make a comparison. Deuterium is comparatively expensive as a light source. Now, um, the emission for this lamp is largely in the UV spectral range, although you can make a go of it in the visible spectral range, too. But the curve I'm showing you is primarily centered in the UV, and if you'll note the comparative intensity, as you go out to longer and longer wavelengths, the emission dies away quite rapidly for the deuterium arc lamp. So clearly they're far better at generating UV light, uh, and given that, it should make sense to you that you're likely to find both light sources, the deuterium and the tungsten halogen, in some UV vis measurements. And that's whenever a researcher needs a continuous source of photons going all the way from the deep UV to the infrared spectral range. And so now I'm going to move on and we're going to talk a bit about cuvettes. Cuvettes are the containers for samples in the UV visible instrument. And they're often abused by investigators, but they 
perform a pretty important role. Uh, generally, um, most cuvettes are, sh are shaped pretty much the same way. They're generally rectangular, and uh, this aspect is extremely important to ensure that the beam of light from our, our uh, lamp, our light source, passes through a region of the sample that uh, contains the same concentration of sample, sample same path length. Uh, now you will see in, in, in biology labs and in gen chem labs, people stick test tubes in a UV visible instrument. It's, this is not a great idea for this reason. The photons hitting the outer edges of the tube are uh, simply not passing through the same uh, path length of sample as those that are hitting the middle. And um, I'll also mention there's another aspect of this uh, the test tube approach that's not wise, and that's because test tubes are basically made out of flint glass or Pyrex. And we uh, just got through seeing the transmission curve for these materials, and glass just simply doesn't transmit photons in the UV spectral range. Uh, and that's why uh, UV vis cuvettes are typically made out of quartz. And you'll find that um, the, uh, the faculty, uh, any research faculty with whom uh, you engage, uh, will be quite concerned about your uh, the proper handling of these materials as uh, quartz cuvettes are rather expensive. Now it is possible uh, to use other materials including plastics and I've mentioned two on this slide polystyrene and methacrylate. These are commonly used I'll say in introductory teaching labs. You may also find them used in uh, biochemistry labs. Polystyrene uh, it can be used in the visible spectral range the vacrylate can be used in the near UV spectral range, but these are not high quality products and if you're intending to engage in uh, high performance uh, UV visible studies, uh, then you really should be uh, working with a uh, quartz uh, UV visible cell. There are a number of manufacturers of these and I do want to point that out. Um, and Helma, Starna, and NSG who I've already called out <laughs> um, they aren't necessarily all rectangular. Uh, you'll see a sort of an interesting uh, water jacketed cylindrical design um, appearing towards the left of the slide. Uh, those were common in the old days and were used a lot, um, uh, but most, most of the cells these days really are rectangular. You can um, mask off a small portion uh, and irradiate uh, a very narrow volume element of a cuvette. And so you'll see there are micro and submicro and semi-micro designs there. Um, they're mostly black material, and then there'll be a small uh, volume element, which is the element you can actually see that you fill with sample and uh, can make a UV visible uh, measurement. <coughs> challenge of using these when you mask off most of the beam is that you are only transmitting through the sample a very, very small number of photons. So you need to make sure you're working with a high quality detector. <coughs> In this slide, I wanted to show you an example of a disposable cell. And um, so that's a uh, polystyrene cell at right showing you the direction that the beam uh, travels through that cuvette. And a note there's a clear side, there's a frosted side, and uh, to help uh, folks who are using these know which side is which, uh, you'll usually see a carrot, and you, I think you can see the triangle and on the top left face. <coughs> that marks and distinguishes the uh, pair of parallel optically transparent sides. When you're using uh, quartz, supracil, or infracil cells, cuvette manufacturers usually mark one of the two optically transparent faces um, with a code, and the code will usually indicate the type of quartz used. Um, QS is a common acronym for uh, supracil, and it will also indicate the uh, sample path length. Uh, cells can come in one centimeter path length, as is depicted on this slide, but they can also come in other path lengths, five millimeter, two millimeter, one millimeter. And why might you want to use those? Um, Any time that you have a uh, analyte characterized with a high molar absorptivity value, 
uh, such as in the case of uh, n pi star or pi pi star chromophores. And so you have a high absorbance. You can cut that absorbance de value down so that you're working with samples with absorbance values, of course, between 0 and 2 absorbance units. Uh, we talked a bit about that in an earlier uh, podcast. And uh, so you can work with a, a smaller path length cell. Um, the last comment I want to make about cuvettes before we move on is it's really important not to handle cuvettes, high quality cuvettes, um, with your hands. You should be wearing gloves and you, you don't want to contaminate those optically transparent faces. Um, they'll attract dirt. The oil on your skin, the dirt, will ultimately lead to degradation of the optical transition properties of your cuvette. The next important component of a UV vis is the monochrometer, and the monochrometer performs an extremely important function, being able to uh, separate white light into light of different wavelengths. Uh, it needs to be able to do that very uh, sensitively. Um, the second important characteristic is it would be really great if the resolution of the light ultimately doesn't depend on the wavelength of the light. And now we'll talk a little bit about how it works and what the design of a monochrometer looks like. Most monochrometers are based on one or two uh, types of dispersive elements, prisms or gratings. Prisms are cheaper elements. Uh, dispersion in a prism is accomplished by refraction of light. A prism is basically a piece of quartz or a piece of glass that's cut at an, an angle. And uh, the resolution of a prism, um, because it's based on refraction of light, ends up being strongly wavelength dependent. Gratings are more expensive. The dispersion in gratings is accomplished by diffraction of light. And the resolution of gratings is essentially independent of wavelength. And so you can see there might be a preference for gratings over prisms. Let's talk about both. If you recall, the speed and the direction of light are changed as they move through different media. And this is the phenomena of refraction. The angle at which light passes when refracted depends on the wavelength. So light of different colors will take slightly different paths when they tra travel through a prism and emerge and continue to travel uh, towards uh, uh, a wall or some source that impedes their uh, further travel. And so you can imagine having a prism mounted on a turret operating under computer control and if you had a metal plate with a hole in it and you place this metal plate after the prism you could rotate the prism and control which colors of light actually emerge through the hole. And that's that's basic idea here. Now I want you to again note that the wavelength dispersion depends on the medium. So you're going to achieve a different wavelength dispersion if you use a glass prism as versus a quartz prism. And remember too that light can't be absorbed by the medium. So if you want wanted to construct a prism-based monochrometer for an instrument that is supposed to be uh, using UV light, you wouldn't want to use a glass prism because the glass will effectively absorb the UV light. The second type of dispersive element used is a grating. And gratings are, and I've drawn a little cartoon for you, uh, based on a very regularly and finely grooved, very flat reflective surface. And when a beam of white light hits this um, grating-like surface uh, at an angle theta, and I've drawn theta there for you, in the cartoon with an arrow showing a white light coming in, then um, the, uh, the light will be separated, diffracted into different beams of, of um, different wavelengths. And it, the um, angle at which the different wavelengths emerge uh, will depend on that, the wavelength of light. And so we'll get a characteristic light pattern, and that's the light pattern, spectrum-like light pattern you see at right. Um, you've probably also seen this light pattern on DVDs as it's produced by basically the same effect. 
<laughs> and I show you the mathematical relationship on this slide. Likely you've seen it in your physics course. Um, but if D is a constant, uh, that groove spacing is a constant, and um, like you to think about, well, what happens as the wavelength of light increases? Well, that, then the incident angle theta, if it's fixed, then that means that the angle of diffraction will increase. And so now we need to think about, so how, are, how is this going to work inside a spectrometer? And so now I'm going to actually show you a, a design for a common configuration of the monochromator. And this is the uh, Cherney Turner uh, monochromator, and it's based around a single grating as the dispersive element, and it contains two prisms. And all the mirrors do, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I didn't mean to say uh, prism. I meant to say two uh, mirrors in a single grating. Um, all the mirrors do is serve as a reflective surface, allowing us to steer our beam of light through uh, the monochromator. The design, um, because you add these two mirrors, you make multiple passes of the light, um, it, it makes it more compact. And the light enters and it exits only through the entrance and the exit shutters. And um, if the white light enters through the uh, bottom left entrance slit, it, it will run the length of the monochromator, hit the mirror, Right now it's all in a nice concentric uh, beam, um, and then it will hit the surface of the grating once it's reflected off that first mirror. Um, and now we'll get diffracted. And so now you're going to start to create a series of divergent beams. And I am showing you two um, in this particular uh, cartoon just to make a point. But you can imagine uh, the effect basically being magnified uh, the more different colors of light I attempted to depict. And um, so you're going to have, if you have an exit sh shutter, uh, which is basically a slit, only one color of light is going to be able to emerge. So if we mount that grating in the center on a turret and we change the angle uh, that it's sitting at, we can basically tune continuously the wavelength of light that we want to have emerge uh, from the exit slit. And that's basically the principle behind a monochromator. So now let's talk about the fourth component of the UV visible instrument, the detector. Uh, there are a few characteristics we would really love for our detector to have. First, it'd be really great if it could recognize and distinguish between different colors of light. Um, but that's out, folks. Um, so uh, that aside, uh, it would be really nice if it could measure low levels of light and high levels of light. So we can study samples that are strongly absorbing and samples that are weakly absorbing in the same instrument. Um, we'd like to make these measurements quickly, so I'd like a rapid response time and I would like to run the instrument all day. So I'd like to be sure that my response is going to be stable over time. So there are three commonly used detectors today. Uh, and actually, I'm going to say, take that back and say two. Uh, I think today you're mostly going to see PMTs and photodiode arrays, although some of you out there are probably still likely working with an instrument based on a simple phototube. Um, we'll discuss PDAs in a separate video, and in uh, this podcast, I'm going to focus on the phototube and the photomultiplier. And we'll start by talking about the phototube because this was the first detector used in UV vis instruments, and it's uh, relatively straightforward. A phototube basically consists of, again, an evacuated quartz envelope. This time it's containing two plate electrodes. Um, just as we discussed earlier in terms of a um, deuterium lamp. But uh, one of these electrodes is coated with um, a, a semiconductor material, and we call it the photocathode. Uh, we actually name both of them. One's the photocathode, the other's the photoanode. And uh, we um, seal this evacuated tube. We apply a voltage across the two electrodes. Uh, we poise the um, 
photocathode at a comparatively negative voltage compared to the photoanode. And then we allow photons of light to strike the face of the photocathode. And what happens is um, the, this electrode emits a stream of high energy electrons that we call photoelectrons. And those are accelerated towards the comparatively positive photoanode. And we measure the current uh, that's produced. And that current will be directly proportional to the flux of incoming photons. And that serves as the basis for our determination of percent T and absorbance in the UV visible instrument. <clears throat> but now I want you to consider for a second the challenge of measuring low light levels with this device. If there are going to be few low, uh, there's, there's going to be a low light level, I'm basically saying there's going to be few photons incident on the photocathode. And if that photocathode material it doesn't have a high percent efficiency in terms of producing photocurrent, um, then it, this is going to be a little bit challenging. And so what if we had some way to boost or multiply the photocurrent? Well, that's the idea behind a photomultiplier. And on this slide, I've drawn a very, very crude cartoon that's intended to help you understand how a photomultiplier or PMT works. Um, it contains a series of electrodes, and it's important for you to understand that the electrodes are not laid out the way that I've drawn them here. I am doing this because I want you to understand what happens inside the device. And so on the next slide, I'll actually show you several typical uh, real-world geometries uh, for the electrodes in a photomultiplier. But in a photomultiplier, there's basically um, three types of electrodes. <coughs> there's the photocathode, and um, we call the last one um, the collection anode. And in between, there's a series of anodes that we call dynodes. And uh, dynodes are basically anodes, each of which is going to be poised at an increasingly more positive voltage compared to the last. And wh what happens here is in this device, when a photon hits that photocathode, just like in the phototube, you're going to see some photoelectrons emitted. But now they're going to be accelerated towards this series of dynodes. And when they strike the first dynode, a stream of photoelectrons and some secondary electrons are going to be produced. And then these electrons are all going to be accelerated to the next dynode, where even more photoelectrons are going to be produced. And this multiplying effect is going to continue until we reach that collection anode. So in a photomultiplier, those dynodes each have the capability of generating multiple electrons per every electron incident on it. We call this the gain in the photomultiplier. And um, I'm going to just consider the example of two. And I have given you <coughs> uh, just a couple electrodes there. And I have, um, we have one, uh, one photon incident on our photocathode, uh, we have one, ideally, fo one photoelectron, if we had perfect efficiency being emitted, it now strikes that first dynode, which has a gain of two, and the gain of two, in my example, is coming from one uh, photoelectron and one secondary electron, so there's your two electrons, that each of those travels to dynode two, which has the same properties, so it's going to produce to, uh, to, uh, two to the second power, or four uh, electrons. And if you had n dynodes, I think you can see where this is going. It's going to be two to the n. There's our multiplying effect. Um, but if the gain were only two, this wouldn't be particularly exciting. The reality is gains in photomultipliers multipliers are typically on the order of 10 to the 6. But the point here, the bottom line is that a photomultiplier allows you to turn a low incident photon flux into a sizable current, uh, a much more measurable current. So photomultipliers are really terrific in terms of being able to me measure light when uh, you have low light levels.
However, downside on these, because they are really sensitive, is that you can uh, flood them um, and uh, hurt them, destroy them really badly with um, lots uh, by flood or flooding them with too many photons. Now as promised, whoops, I wanted to show you uh, some photomultiplier geometries. These are two. They always have pretty cool names. Um, so uh, you have a squirrel in a cage and box and grid that I've selected out for you because they sort of illustrate two different types of, of, of photomultiplier geometries. And, um, the photocathode is transparent in the box and grid geometry. And so it's painted basically on the end of the uh, photomultiplier tube, whereas in the squirrel and cage, the geometry side on, and it's an uh, opaque uh, uh, photocathode. Uh, and then you can see um, in each of them, there's some numbers depicted for the uh, squirrel in the cage. You can see the path in red of the um, photocurrent as it moves through the device uh, being uh, moving from one dynode to the next dynode very much like a squirrel in a cage in the squirrel in cage and then uh, in black with a multitude of little tiny arrows you can get a sense of how of the I'll call it reflective uh, properties and, and what the path begins to look like for electrons as it moves in the box and grid uh, but I think that's probably about enough for now in terms of phototubes and photomultipliers. So now I want to go back to the block diagram for the UV visible instrument and I want to put everything together. So we use deuterium and tungsten halogen lamps to produce UV visible near infrared light. We send this polychromatic light into a monochromator which uses either prisms or gratings in order to turn that many colored light into monochromatic light. Uh, so we can separate out and send a specific color or wavelength of light uh, into our sample cell, our sample contained in a cuvette, a sample cell, and uh, then the photons of that specific wavelength that aren't absorbed e are transmitted through the sample and they're incident on our uh, photo detector and we they whether it's a photomultiplier or it is a, a, a photo tube we basically are turning a photon based signal into an electron based signal which is proportional uh, to the uh, number of photons that were transmitted and knowing how many photons of light at a specific wavelength were incident on the sample now having information, quantitative information on how many got through. Uh, we have information on percent transmittance at that wavelength, which gives us absorbance and can ultimately give us analyte concentration. And if we basically scan um, our monochromator sequentially from one wavelength of light to the next through an entire wavelength range, we can obtain a plot called a spectrum, which reflects the absorbance or if you will, the percent transmittance um, at each wavelength from uh, uh, say uh, 200 all the way out to uh, 800 uh, nanometers in the uh, UV visible spectral range. And that can give us information in terms of the electronic structure of our uh, chromophore in our sample. And I think with that, that's gonna bring this podcast to a close. This is really a good point uh, for you to take a moment and to reflect before you leave. So pause the podcast, just don't stop it. And I'd like you to ask yourself, can you at this point draw a blo basic block diagram for UV Viz and explain how it works? Uh, what are two commonly used excitation sources? Can you explain how they produce light? Can you explain the function of a monochromator and identify two different dispersive elements that are commonly used in monochromators. How do each of these dispersive elements work? Can you compare two different detection schemes um, and explain what the potential advantages and disadvantages might be of each? Um, what are the two different UV-Vis detectors? Uh, 
that people typically find and encounter and um, what are their um, advantages and disadvantages. And with that, look forward to seeing you in the next podcast. Thank you.